Well, thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn Resume Building. I'm Greg Berry, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Just a quick note, since we are virtual, don't be surprised if things may seem out of place or a technical issue may pop up throughout today's presentation. If you experience any issues with your video or audio, please click, click the reconnect button at the top of your screen. This will get you back to the webinar right away. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded onto our website tomorrow. If you have any questions throughout the Lunch and Learn, please place them in the chat room. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of Adam's presentation. Today's webinar is part of our Backpacks to Briefcases Evergreen Certificate Series. This series has four events each year, two in the spring, two in the fall. Topics will focus on financial planning, personal branding, workplace skills, and personal life. Between each event, there will be a chance to take advantage of golden electives. These will be things like today's Lunch and Learn, networking opportunities, and even volunteering opportunities. To receive your Evergreen Certificate and your Evergreen Lapel Pen, you must complete all four Evergreen events and two golden electives. These do not have to happen all during the same calendar year. Just jump in, join us at any time. Students and young alumni are welcome to participate. We have more information at online at alumni.uab.edu slash backpacks. I will also highlight upcoming opportunities for this program after this presentation. Today, we welcome Adam Roderick, a 2009 graduate of the UAB College of Arts and Sciences. Adam just began a new chapter in his life as the manager of learning and belonging at Milo's Tea Company. Previously, he was a member of UAB staff for more than eight years, including spending time as associate director for the UAB Career Center. At this time, I would like to turn things over to Adam. Welcome, Adam. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Greg. It is great to be here. Um, always enjoy a chance to reconnect uh, with UAV in the seven short weeks that I've been gone. Uh, it's great to reconnect and have a chance to spend some time with everyone this afternoon. Um, and I first want to say thank you for giving me this opportunity and, and to each of you for investing in this. I think this is a really important conversation to kind of uh, kickstart that career uh, trajectory. So we'll talk about that path here in a little bit. But the first step in that is making sure we have a resume uh, that gets us to where we want to go. Um, and so before we get started, I do want to mention I know uh, Greg has dropped in the chat uh, to to you know put questions in there because the, uh, I was telling Craig before we got started, the way I built this out was not for me to take the full hour talking at you. I'd very much like for each of you to feel empowered to share questions, to share uh, thoughts, concerns, um, because I want to spend some time at the end to circle back and make sure that we can address those um, that are unique to you. You know, if you have something that you want to ask, please feel free to do that, and we'll have some time at the end to uh, to circle back and make sure we address it. So with that being said. Uh, during our time today, I'm really going to focus on knocking out three specific takeaways. And I want you to hold me to this because I'm going to revisit these at the end. And if you feel like we haven't addressed these three takeaways, I want to make sure we spend some time uh, doing that. So the first, we're going to identify and effectively utilize the basic components of a resume. So we'll walk through what those four components are. Second, we'll create accomplishment statements using the APR method or action plus problem or project plus result formula. Uh, we'll also articulate our understanding of an applicant tracking system and how to tailor your resume using keywords, right? So we want to make sure we get through that ATS so that someone uh, in HR actually puts eyes on our resume and we have a chance to actually move them forward in that process. So these are the three takeaways we're going to hit. Um, so hold me to it. Like I said, I'm going to circle back to it at the end. And if you don't feel like I've adequately addressed these, let me know. And we'll spend some time uh, diving in a little bit deeper. So to kick things off, you know, when we think about a resume, what we're really talking about is standing out amongst the crowd. You know, your resume is going to be your first impression when we're looking at uh, communicating with potential employers. And we need to keep in mind, um, you know, just to be candid, because I feel like, you know, this is an honest conversation. You know, we're all friends here. So we, I think we need to talk as candidly as possible about this process. You know, when you apply for a position, you could be one of five, you could be run of 25, you could be one of 500, you know, depending on the position that you're applying for. And so when you think about um, that reality, it becomes very important very quickly for us to make sure that we're standing out amongst that crowd. And so the resume is our first chance to do that. And that progression in, the, in, in terms of securing that offer that I talked about a minute ago uh, is really important, right? So the goal of the resume is to get the interview and the goal of the interview is to get the offer. And so the resume is really important to make sure that we kickstart that, that progression uh, on the right foot and make sure that we progress because if we don't have a good resume, we're not getting an interview. And if we don't get an interview, we're certainly not gonna get an offer. Uh, and so your resume is really a key component to making sure that we uh, start strong in that process and make sure that we uh, put our best foot forward when we're trying to stand out amongst that crowd. Uh, so that's kind of the big picture of what we're shooting for 
with our resume and how we want to make sure that we can utilize it to our advantage. So the four components that I mentioned um, that we're going to present here, but we'll dive into each individually, is name and contact information, uh, profile summary or summary statement, and then your education and experience. Okay. So we're going to, again, dive into each of these individually. I'm going to kind of walk through what they are. But I also encourage you, if you have a resume uh, handy, I would I would encourage you to pull it out, you know, and have it ready. You may want to, you know, mark it up as we go through. You may want to jot down some thoughts. If you have questions that are related to things that you see as we go, um, I would encourage you to get it out, kind of follow along um, as we go through, because that may be a good place for us to jump off, jump off into future conversations as we wrap up towards the end. All right, so name and contact information. Um, so this section is probably the most basic, but there's a lot that we want to make sure we cover here. And I think this is a good point for us to also talk about a few best practices generally when we're talking about our resume. So first and foremost, you want to make sure you have your name. You want to have it be the name that you go by, right? You don't want to have a name that um, you wouldn't recognize if someone called it by, you know, called you by that name. It's not the name that your mom calls you when you're in trouble. It's the name that you actually go by every day. Uh, so, you know, whether it's Sherelle, Michael, Darlene, I see Carla, I see Tiffany, I see Megan, um, you know, put your name out there, you know, let people know who you are um, and, and make sure that's a, a bold statement at the very beginning. The next thing we're seeing is address. Now, this is um, a point of conversation that I really want to hit on. So some people want to put their, their address, including their street address on their resume. That's kind of a personal choice, right? I don't think that that's necessarily a best practice, not something that you certainly have to do. Um, a lot of people, instead of putting their street address, their, their street number, will simply put the city and the state that they live in, right? Because it is important for an employer to know geographically where you're located, uh, but it's not necessarily important for them to know specifically where your house is, right? So uh, usually in the application for a position, they're going to ask for your street address, so they'll already have that information. Um, but the thing about a resume, you know, if you're using your resume the way that you want to, it's getting passed around in networking circles, you know, you're using it for uh, exploring opportunities. So you re never really know whose hands your resume is going to end up in. Uh, and with that being the case, you want to be kind of strategic with the personal information that you do put out there. And for some people, that street address is a little uh, too personal. The next thing that you'll see um, is your email address and your phone number, right? So email, we definitely want to make sure that this is a professional email. But I would say even more importantly, we want to make sure that this is an email that we answer, right? So if you have a Yahoo account set up for that free trial of Netflix or that Black Friday sale, or whatever it is, it just kind of your junk collector, right? Uh, we don't want to put that one because that's not the one we're going to answer. That's not the one that we're going to keep tabs on. We want to put the one that we actually check on a regular basis, right? And then same is true with the phone numbers, right? We know we, we all get those like extended car warranty calls on our phone number or on our phones. And we see that phone number that says unknown. Um, you know, we're very tempted just to ignore that. But I will say when you're applying for positions, um, I would say answer every call because you never know who's coming through. You never know what uh, the person on the other end maybe reaching out to you talk to you about and maybe the offer that you're waiting for uh, and maybe the invitation for an interview so do make sure when you're applying for positions that you are answering those phone numbers even if you don't recognize them okay so a few other things i want to mention here uh, font and font size because this will apply throughout the rest of the resume as well when we think about fonts you know, Times New Roman has kind of been the standard font for, for many, many years, for decades, actually. Um, but the thing that we're actually doing now is shifting away from Times New Roman and shifting away from those serif fonts. So if you think about the T uh, in Times New Roman, that T has these feet and it has these kind of little hanging accents right on the top of the T. Those accents and feet are what we call serifs. Uh, it's just kind of a script serif. And what we're shifting to is actually sans serif or fonts without those serifs, okay? So we're looking at more blocked out, more, uh, you know, evenly distributed text like you see here. So the ones I would recommend, uh, if you want to jot these down, are Arial, Calibri, and Tahoma. Those are kind of the three standard gold standards when it comes to best practices and font. Um, and the reason that's important, I know that sounds nitpicky, but if we don't do that and we still use Times New Roman and we've moved away from Times New Roman as a best practice, it's a way to make your resume feel very dated, very out of out of step uh, and need... Um, you know, need to update, right? And we don't want that perception to be felt uh, and don't want that to be a hindrance to people wanting to dive deeper into our resume, right? And so that Times New Roman uh, has been the best practice for a long time, but now we're moving away from that. So Arial, Calibri, Tahoma, those are the ones I would definitely recommend. And then with font size, um, we recommend anything from 10.5 to 12 point font with one exception. And as you see here, it's your name, right? So we wanna make sure that they know this is your resume. This is not just a resume. 
This is Terrell's resume. This is Michael's resume. This is Darlene's resume, right? And so we want to use this as an exception to go big, <laughs> you know, go to 20 font or whatever it may be to make sure that your name stands out at the top of your resume as opposed to just being another resume in the pile, right? So it's probably a lot more information than you thought I would cover with contact information, but I think it's a great place for us to start and kind of set some frameworks for how we're going to move forward. So next up is profile summary and summary statement. So I like to have a little fun uh, with my illustration of how we conceptualize this, right? So let's say it's Thursday night, it's tomorrow night, you've had a busy week, you don't really have much going on Friday, you know, you don't have any plans for the weekend, there's nothing you need to really prepare for. So you're sitting down, you got Netflix on, you're trying to figure out what to watch, right? So you know on Netflix or many other streaming services for that matter, you hover over a title and if you hover long enough, that starts to play, right? It starts to play like a trailer, starts to play like a preview, and the whole point of that is for that show, amongst the thousands that you have options to engage in, they're trying to get you to watch that one, right? They're trying to get you to watch that show, that movie, whatever it may be. And the same thing is happening with your profile summary or summary statement on your resume, right? Again, you may be applying with five other people, but you also may be applying with 500 other people. And so it's really important that we get that attention very early and we re retain that attention uh, very early as well. And so the profile summary is a great, great way for us to do that so that people actually dive into your resume, get excited about reading your resume, um, and, and, and really gives you the best leverage point for moving forward in that process that we talked about earlier. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Um, we can do kind of a bulleted profile of the high points. So as you can see here uh, at the top, we can do three to five bullet points that kind of highlight the biggest, you know, takeaways that we want someone to have from our resume, right? So this would be a repetition excuse me, of what they'll find in the resume, but we want to pull it to the top to make it the most exciting, the most, you know, uh, the most eye-catching as we possibly can make it from the very beginning. And so it could be years of experience, it could be proficiencies, it could be uh, leadership experience, it could be, uh, you know, it could be whatever you want it to be. But we would say try to keep it to three to five bullets because the more bullets that we add, the less impact they're going to have, right? And so we want to be very strategic with those that we select and we want to pull those up to the top as much as possible. The other thing we can think about is a summary of qualifications. And I would recommend this approach if you're going into like a really technical field, right? So if you're going into research, if you're going into computing, if you're going into even like teaching uh, where certifications, qualifications, uh, credentialing, things like that are really important, uh, this is a great way for us to pull that up to the top, right? So that gets it out of the way at the very beginning. People don't have any questions about that. And what they're really looking at with the rest of your resume is your fit as a person, right? Your fit as an individual, your fit as a potential future employee. So as you can see here, it can be coding languages, it can be software, operating systems, it can be teaching certifications, it could be research experience, it could be uh, credentials. I mean, it could be, you know, anything you want it to be, kind of summarizing those qualifications as succinctly as possible for a potential future employer. And then finally, the third option we can look at is a narrative summary, um, where we just take the profile from the top and do it in a narrative format as opposed to a bulleted. A few words of caution here, um, you know, make sure it is short and concise. You don't want it to turn into like a full half page paragraph. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is research has shown that, you know, the human eye likes bullet points, basically. And, you know, the more we can bullet out things and make them, you know, to the point and, and eye catching, the better off we're going to be in terms of getting the attention we want for our resume. So you can certainly do a narrative. Um, just understand that it's a little bit harder for the human eye to navigate through a narrative block of text when it is compared to like a bulleted out list. Right. So. Um, up to you. Uh, there's not a wrong answer here. Uh, and I think, you know, each of these is a good potential fit, depending on what you're looking for. But I do want to make sure that we hit this to know um, that how important it is for us to get the attention we want from the very beginning when someone is reviewing our resume. All right, education. So we're all proud blazers, right? And we want to make sure that we can highlight that in our uh, resume. Uh, and so a few points here. Uh, I know, again, this may seem like a very straightforward section, but a few things I do want to note. First and foremost, we want to write out the entirety when it comes to the name of our, our university, right? We don't want to put UAB. We want to put the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We also want to make sure we include the city. I know that Birmingham is in the name of our university, so it seems a little redundant, but it is the best practice, right? Because if you're thinking about attending Marshall or St. John's or, you know, Xavier, it's not necessarily inherent to folks where those universities are located, right? And so the best practice is that we put the city in the state in which we attended that institution. The next thing we want to have is our degree. Now, what I when I say degree, what I mean here is the full name of your degree. So as you see, it's Bachelor's of Art in History, or Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, or Master's of Education in Clinical Counseling, 
our educational doctor in secondary education or doctor of philosophy and history, right? So we don't just want to put history. We don't want to just put chemistry or, or psychology or kinesiology or whatever it may be. We want to call out the whole name of the degree, right? So um, you earned every letter. We want to highlight every letter. Uh, and we want to make sure we include that on our resume. And then graduation. So if you haven't graduated yet, we do recommend putting your expected graduation. But for those of you who have, we just want to put the date, or excuse me, the month and the year. So May 21, December 20, December 2002, you know, May 1995, whatever it may be that fits you. Just make sure you let them know when you graduated. And then kind of some finer points here. You see GPA and you see minor. Um, this is also the place that we would want to include, you know, uh, academic achievements, right? So if you were magna cum laude, if you were, uh, you know, presidential honors, you know, those types of things, we can include those here if you would like. We can also include GPA. However, <laughs> you know, GPAs are great for entry level positions, but the further you get into your career, uh, the more I would encourage you to think about shifting away from including your GPA on your resume. Uh, usually the, uh, you know, industry experience becomes a little bit more important as you move forward. Uh, but you can't put your GPA. We just say, you know, make sure it's at least above a 3.5 if you include it. Uh, and then also minors, you know, if it is relevant for what you're applying for, I would definitely include a minor uh, if, it, if it adds value. You know, I just think you need to ask your question. You ask yourself that question of, you know, does it add value or is it just adding it to kind of show off a little bit, right? So um, space is critical on a resume. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. And so we definitely don't want to put things on there that are not relevant and, and that don't add value to what we're trying to apply for. Okay, so experience. Are y'all ready to roll up your sleeves? This is kind of the uh, the main section of your resume and where we'll spend most of our time today uh, kind of talking through this. So when we think about experience, um, well, let me get this out of the way first. So it's, it's formatted very similarly to education, right? So when we think about experience, we wanna first and foremost put the place that we worked, right? So as you can see here in this example, UAB Alumni Relations. We wanna include the city that we worked in, so Birmingham, Alabama our title when we worked there, so communication intern, and then we wanna put the date and time frame that we worked, right? So May, 2019 to present. That's kind of where the standardization stops when it comes to experience. So what you see below that are what we call accomplishment statements, right? Those bulleted lists of accomplishments and impacts that you've had in the roles that you've had in the past or that you have currently. There is so much free freedom here and leeway. So I'm going to go through kind of some best practices and what we recommend. But please understand that this is your opportunity to shine, right? This is your opportunity to stand apart. This is your opportunity to be creative. Um, and this is an opportunity to really, you know, put some work into your resume. Your resume is going to be as successful as the amount of time and effort and work that you put into it, right? It's not something that's just copy and pasting job descriptions. We really need to think strategically about our accomplishment statements, okay? So we'll go through how to formulate them here in a minute. But Really what we're trying to do with these accomplishment statements is show how we went above and beyond the job description, right? They don't want to just know passively what you were tasked with doing based on your job description. They want to know how you excelled. They want to know how you had an impact. They want to know how you gained skill sets that are valuable for future positions. So that's what we're trying to articulate. We're trying to let them know, hey, I didn't just show up for work every day. Here's the impact I had when I showed up for work every day, right? Um, and we want to make sure we do that successfully. And another thing I'll mention that I think is important to note here is as you look at these accomplishment statements, this bulleted list, check out those first words, right? Design, create, draft, plan, increased, manage, tracked. Those are action verbs, right? We want to make sure we start off each of these accomplishment statements with action verbs. Every resume uh, is going to be competing against all the other resumes that are sitting in that stack with, right? We've talked about that. And so if we're not communicating impact and we're not doing it in an effective way with our accomplishment statements, we're probably not going to sift our way up to the top of that stack, right? And so we want to make sure that very quickly, very succinctly, and very efficiently, the person who's reviewing our resume can see the impact that we have without a doubt, right? And so those action verbs are critical to being able to kick off your accomplishment statement in the right way, um, but making sure that you have these constructed in a way that adds value to the positions you're applying for is, uh, is critically important. And, and we do recommend you know, three to five bullets for each of the past experiences. You don't want it to be um, too many because then you start to lose value, right? The quantity, uh, and, you know, decreases rarity uh, and it decreases the impact that you could potentially have with each of these accomplishment statements. So as hard as it is, I would encourage you to try to find the most important things and focus on communicating that as you move forward in the process. Another thing I'll mention here, I'm going to go through some other examples in a minute, but I am my eyes kind of drawing to this. 
So if you look at that last bullet point with that first piece of experience, uh, increasing alumni participation by 25%, right? The next one you see down that first one, uh, first accomplishment statement, increased membership from 13 to 35, okay? Or that last one there at the very, very bottom, recruited prospective students at 14 events throughout Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi. Quantification is your friend. If we can quantify our accomplishment statements with, with metrics, with outcomes, with things that are um, objective as opposed to subjective, we're doing ourselves a favor, right? So if you think about being that recruiter that is reviewing these resumes, right? They don't know you. They don't know many of the applicants that are applying for these positions. And when you say things like, you know, successfully navigated, fill in the blank, successfully navigated recruitment, uh, you know, initiative, you know, you're really just asking them to take your word for it, right? You don't have anything to show for it. You're saying, hey, just trust me that I did this and trust me that it was impactful. What's a lot more effective is if we can say we, we orchestrated and implemented a recruitment initiative that, you know, gained 300 extra members, right? Or increased uh, membership by 15% or, you know, some kind of quantification that moves it away from the subjective and gets it into the objective where nobody can dispute that, right? Like we have that number, we have that, um, you know, that, that flag that we planted for that success. Um, that is something we would definitely recommend because that makes a lot more um, makes it a lot more impactful and it takes it again away from that subjective and moves it into the objective. So quantification is your is your friend. So here's a few other examples. And what's important to note here is that with experience, we can have one experience section where everything fits into one kind of category or depending on your past experiences, we can kind of break them out as you see here. So we can have research experience, we can look at volunteer experience, we can look at community experience. We can look at for-profit, non-profit. Um, we can look at educational experience, classroom experience. There's really no limit to, you know, the creativity that we can have when we look at each of these experience points. Um, so as you can see here, formatting is still the same. Um, you know, those, those action uh, verbs are still there. Those accomplishment statements are still really important. Those frameworks are still there. Where do we work? What was our title? Where, where, where was it located? And what was the time frame that we worked there? All those are the same. We just wanna make sure that we categorize these things in a very strategic way to make sure that we're communicating impact as efficiently as possible with those potential recruiters. Here's some other examples. So if you're looking at teaching positions, you know, classroom experience, you were a student teacher at Helena Elementary School, you had a related experience as a teacher at Best Daycare Center. Um, you know, that's really important to pull out, right? Because you wanna make sure that, you know, as you're moving through this process, they're, they're seeing relevance, they're seeing value in you as a potential applicant. And if we can make it tailored to them as much as possible, we're doing ourselves a huge favor. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute as well. Again, relevant experience. I mean, these are all kind of just going through the same concepts, but showing you that there's not any kind of limit on the way that we can categorize this and, and construct this to make it work to our advantage as much as possible. All right, so I know we talked about this a good bit already, but I do want to circle back to accomplishment statements because I would argue this is probably the most important part of your resume. You know, I mean, communicating where you got your education, communicating, you know, your contact information, your profile, all that stuff is really important. Um, but all that kind of honestly doesn't matter if we can't communicate impact that we've had in potential uh, or in past positions, right? And how that, how that can translate to potential impact in these future roles. And so one of the ways that we encourage people to construct their accomplishment statements is by using the APR formula, okay? So action, what are we doing? What did we do? Problem or project? What were the circumstances, conditions, and challenges? And then finally, the most important part, what was the result? Uh, what happened because of our intervention? What happened because of our actions, okay? Now it's not, um, you know, set in stone. There's a lot of flexibility that we can have with this, um, you know, but I think having an action that you took in some situation to achieve some outcome is really what we're shooting for. So action plus problem or project equals result is a great framework to start from as we're you know, constructing those accomplishment statements as we move forward. So here's an example. Coordinated, so action, right? Action verb. Five fundraising events for local homeless shelters. So that was the project. That was what we were tasked with. Raising over $5,000, which was 20% over our goal. So the result, and as you can see, quantification as well, right? So as you can see, in just a very short sentence, we've communicated a lot, right? So instead of just responsible for fundraising efforts, and that's all we say, we can say coordinated five fundraising events for local homeless shelters raising over $5,000 or 20% over our goal. 
I don't know about you, but I would definitely be more attracted to the latter, right? As opposed to just say responsible for fundraising efforts. Um, and, you know, I think any recruiter would say the same. And so by doing uh, this and by constructing our accomplishment statements in this way, we are really accentuating impact. We're showing that we went uh, above and beyond the job description and actually had a substantial impact in the roles that we had. Um, and more importantly, we're excited to translate that into future roles as well, right? So I would encourage you to take some time, you know, go through your resume, think about those past experiences, think about how you can construct these accomplishment statements using this form formula, APR, action plus problem or project equals result. Uh, and I think you'll find that it makes it a lot more impactful. It makes it a lot more relevant. It, it communicates a lot more value. And I think you'll have a lot more success as you move forward and looking for uh, those future positions. Okay, so uh, applicant tracking systems. Let's talk about this a little bit because I think this is something not a lot of people know about, but it's critically important. Um, so this may hit some people in the fields, uh, but if you are using the same resume to apply for multiple positions, your chances of being successful are very, very small. And, you know, in contrast, what we instead recommend is for every position that you apply for, tailor your resume for that position. And there's a couple of reasons that we, we want to do that and we'll talk through that. But the main reason we want to do that is because of applicant tracking systems. OK, so what an applicant tracking system is or ATS is a computer program, a software system that HR uh, professionals implement to review resumes looking for keywords, qualifications, and matches to the positions that you're applying for, right? So what it will do is scour your, your application, scour your resume, your cover letter, and it will look for keywords and qualifications, and it will give a percentage match, okay? So that HR professional gets my resume, and it's a, you know, 40% match, right? Probably not gonna bring me in for an interview, right? They're looking for those that are, you know, 70% match, 80% match. It doesn't have to be 100% match because there's obviously gonna be growth potential in all these roles, but if you're coming in at a 40, if you're coming in at a 30, uh, because you, you you didn't ad adequately, you know, tailor your resume for the position you're applying for, you're not going to get that opportunity. OK, um, so every single position that you apply for, tailor that resume, make sure it is mirroring that job that you're applying for. And let me kind of illustrate what this looks like in practice. So this is a digital content specialist position for for UAB. Actually, this is a UAB position. And as you can see in the red lettering, we've gone through and kind of picked out what we think an applicant tracking system would key on, okay? So for a digital content specialist, we're looking at communication, uh, digital presence, marketing, uh, communication strategies, bachelor's degree, Google Analytics, editing analytics. We see Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. So what that means is when you apply for that position, the ATS is going to be looking through your resume to see how many of these are mirrored in your resume, right? And if they're not mirrored, you're probably not going to pass through, okay? So what we want to do as much as possible is with any job description, go through and highlight what we think are going to be those keywords and qualifications, okay? And we more importantly, want to mirror those back to our resume as much as possible, okay? So if they're using that word, if they're using that phrase, if they're calling it one thing, but we happen to be calling it something else, don't do that. Use the language they use, use the phrasing they use, use the words that they use. Now, a caveat to that, if you don't have that credential, you don't have that certification, you don't have that background, please do not lie. Well, I'm not saying be deceitful. Um, we don't want to go that route. That is a really, big, really bad route um, to go. But we do want to try to, as much as we can, mirror what they're looking for with the experiences that we've had, with the education that we have, with the credentials that we have. Um, because again, if we don't, you know, the resume is not going to get us the interview. And if we don't get the interview, we're not going to get the offer. OK, so every position you apply for, make sure you're tailoring that resume for that position. All right. So real quick, some other resume tips and tricks uh, as I wrap up. I know you probably all heard about the one page resume, right? Everybody says one page resume. Um, if you can do a one page resume, I would recommend that. I think the more concise and more focused we can make it, the better. However, I think that's kind of a myth. You know, I think if we can, instead of focusing on qual uh, quantity, focus on quality, we're heading in the right direction. So instead of saying, keep it to a page, I would instead ask you a question, is what you're adding to your resume adding value to that potential employer, okay? If you can say yes, put it in there. If you can't say yes, take it out. And I know that's very hard for some people because, you know, those are years potentially of your life that you've invested in these positions or in these credentials or that education or whatever it may be. But if it is not relevant 
to what you're applying for, it's not going to add any value to that application, right? And so as hard as that seems, as cold as that sounds, if it's not relevant, let's try to think about a way that we can extract it and instead focus on the relevant skills and relevant experiences that do add value as we move forward, okay? So when it comes to length, if you have a page and a half or two pages of high quality content, go with it. Um, however, if you have two pages and about a page and a half of it's really good, but the last half of it's kind of fluffy, let's get rid of it. Let's not add it. Let's, let's eliminate things that don't add value. Okay. Um, when we think about the, uh, you know, tailoring the, the resumes, we definitely want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're learning as much as we can about the companies that we're applying for. So obviously we, we have the applicant tracking system we're trying to navigate through, but you also want to think through like, okay, once it gets past the applicant tracking system, what is a human in HR, the human eyes that are eventually going to get placed on my resume? What are they looking for, right? I've gone through ATS. So they're looking for me as a person to mirror what's important to them organizationally, right? Their mission, their vision, their strategic priorities. So consider that in your resume. If there are things and qualities and characteristics that we can echo, go above and beyond and make sure that we're including those, okay? What we don't want to do, however, is just list skills, okay? So this is really, really important. A lot of people will have a section on their resume where it's just skills, leader, excellent communicator, problem solver, uh, you know, fill in the blank. I mean, there's limitless skills that we can include. And a lot of people go that route. But again, going back to what I said earlier, when you do that, you're really asking the recruiter, hey, trust me, trust me that I'm a good leader. Hey, trust me that I'm good at communicating. Hey, trust me that I'm a good problem solver. So instead of doing that, what I would encourage you to think about doing is transition those skills that you're, you're attesting to Put those into your accomplishment statements. Instead of just saying I'm a good leader, show them how you're a good leader, right? Build an accomplishment statement around your leadership experience, your leadership successes. Instead of just saying I'm a good problem solver, build out an accomplishment statement talking about a problem that you were navigating and that you, you navigated successfully to achieve a positive result, okay? So instead of just listing those skills, I would encourage you to show versus tell, okay? So show them how you've achieved those skill sets as opposed to just saying, hey, I have them, okay? And then the final thing I'll mention here, references so a lot of people think that you we need to include like three to five references on our resume um you do not as a matter of fact you don't have to include any references on your resume you know when you apply for positions they may ask for references in the application process um and if they do obviously give them but with your resume uh, you know your references are going to really be dependent on the positions that you're applying for and again if your resume is kind of floating through your network or it's getting passed around which is a good thing um those references may not be the relevant references that you want to have for that particular position or that particular conversation, right? So the best thing to do is not even say references available upon request or, you know, anything like that. Just leave them off. And if people want to reach out to you and talk about your past experiences and want to explore your references, have them ready. Give them to them if they ask for them, but you don't have to volunteer them up front, okay? So those are kind of some last minute tips and tricks. All right, so I do want to mention the UAB Career Center. So as Greg mentioned, I did actually work in the Career Center for many, many years, so I'm a little biased here, but I can tell you the UAB Career Center does great work and they are here for every single one of you. One of the perks that a lot of people don't know about uh, of being a UAB student and being a UAB alumni is that you actually have access to the UAB Career Center for the rest of your life. Uh, and these folks are really excited to be there for you to help support you in your career journey now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, um, but they can't help you unless you invite them into that conversation, right? So reach out to them. They can help you with your resume, interview prep, job search strategies, career exploration, and really so much more. Um, and so I would strongly encourage you to get to know the Career Center staff, reach out to them, let them know what your goals are, let them know where your struggles might be currently, and let them kind of help support you through that process. They're really easy to find their website. They actually have a, a Zoom link on the, on the front page of their website, and they have walk-in hours, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and all you have to do is click on that link and someone will be on the other end of that Zoom waiting to chat with you. Um, so if you want to do it that way, you can. I, if you're in Handshake, you can also set up an appointment in Handshake with UAB Career Center. Um, so either way you go, uh, someone will be there with you uh, to walk you through whatever you need in terms of career success and career support. And obviously their contact information, they're on Instagram and, and Facebook. So I'd encourage you to follow them and keep up with what's going on. You can also find them in the Hill Student Center in room 307. And then I see uh, Greg actually just dropped in the UAB Career Center uh, website in the chat. Thank you for that. So if you want to check them out there, you can also do that. But super easy to find. They are here for you. They want to help support you in your career journey. 
but again, they can't do that unless you invite them into that journey, right? So um, get to know them, let them know what your goals are and let, let them help support you as you work towards achieving those goals. Okay, so I told you guys that I would circle back to the takeaways and we're gonna get to the chat and the, the discussion here in a minute. But if I did not hit any of these takeaways, please let me know. I, my goal today is that we walk away with you guys feeling like you know how to knock each of these things out of the park, okay? That you know what the basic components of a resume are. You know how to construct an APR uh, formula accomplishment statement, that you know how to navigate through an applicant tracking system and how to, how to customize your, uh, your resume and your application for the jobs that you're applying for. So if you don't, let me know. Uh, and we'll make sure to talk about that as we uh, have discussion here in a minute. But before we do that, I do want to challenge you with some next steps. Build your resume. If you don't have a resume, start right now. The more we can work through a resume and refine it and focus it, the better off we're going to be. It's not a one, one this and done kind of thing. It takes repetition. It takes refinement. It takes time. So if you don't have one, build one today. Start there and just continue to focus it, refine it, chisel away at it, and make it as sharp as you possibly can make it. Uh, schedule an appointment with the Career Center. They would love to get to know each and every one of you, so I would encourage you to do that. Um, add your resume and your experience to your handshake and LinkedIn profile. Make sure people can see the impact and the experiences that you have uh, and help to develop out that network that can work for you as you move forward. Attend a career event. The UAB Career Center has many career events going on all the time. So go talk to employers. You know, the more you talk to an employer, the better you get at it. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, just takes repetition and practice. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And then finally, and I'm going to steal Greg's thunder because I know he's going to mention this too. Uh, I will be back next Thursday for interview skills, uh, the 14th of April, to kind of talk about the next step in that progression, right? So we talked about resume getting the interview and the interview getting the offer. So hopefully today you feel good about the resume. And then next week we'll talk about the interview. And then it's just up to you to get that offer, right? So if we can get the resume and the interview knocked out, hopefully you guys are going to get inundated and just drowned in offers as you move forward. Um, so I would encourage you to join us next week on the 14th. Um, to kind of continue the, pro, uh, the progression towards those offers that you guys are working towards. All right, I'll open up to questions and discussions, but I do want to say thank you again for uh, the time today. Um, it's been an honor to have a chance to speak with you for a minute. Um, but with that, I'll open it up to any uh, questions that may have popped up. And go ahead and test those questions in the chat box. I'll facilitate those and ask Adam those questions. He did allude to a couple of career days or um, days that you can actually meet with people. One's going on right now, UAB Education Interview Day is in the Hill Student Center Ballroom on the third floor. It goes until three o'clock. And then another one coming up, um, let me scroll down to this. It's UAB Stay in the Magic City Career Fair, and that's coming up on the 13th. That will also be in the Hill Student Center Ballrooms from 11 to two. And they're constantly having these different career fairs. And we typically work very well with the Career Center and getting these on our website, yep. which is just alumni.uab.edu slash events. So some of the questions that we have coming in, um, Adam, um, is the educate in the education section, would you recommend indicating if it's an online only student? And if so, do you still include the city and state of the school? That's a great question. Um, you don't have to designate online. Um, that's a really great question. I, I, that's um, that's kind of an interesting wrinkle. So if it is an online degree, you don't have to indicate that. It doesn't matter if you did it in person, it doesn't matter if you did it online. Um, I would also though encourage you to look up like if it is University of Phoenix or you know whatever the online institution is, they have a home base somewhere. Uh, and so I would just mirror that whatever city, where, wherever they're incorporated, whether it's in the States and maybe overseas, I would just indicate, you know, that this institution is located at this particular location, corporate anyway, is um, and just kind of go from there. OK, so is the is the accomplishment statements its own section of the resume or is that practice applied to the experience section of the resume? Good question. So um, the accomplishment statements, each accomplishment statement needs to be tied to the experience that it occurred in, right? So if I worked at the alumni, if I worked at U of A National Alumni Society, my accomplishment statements under that need to be tied to the National Alumni Society, right? And before that, I happened to work at, you know, um, the UAB Career Center, right? And all those accomplishment statements that I have after that need to tie back to the UAB Career Center. So they do need to be kind of constructed in in ways where they fall under the pieces of experience that you had in the past, they need to all align with where those accomplishment statements occurred. So how would you add post-grad certificates? Where on the resume do you include those? 
right in the education section. So you could say, you know, UAB uh, certificate in social media, right? Or you could say a certificate in leadership. You could say whatever it is, do it the same way you would do a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctoral degree, um, the same exact format, just in indicate that it's a graduate certificate as opposed to, um, to just a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a doctorate. What does a typical resume for graduate school look like, or will it reflect your standard resume? Great question. So it's really, um, again, going back to value, right? What are those graduate programs looking for? You know, if you're applying for a graduate program in fine arts and you're applying for an MBA, those are going to look very different, right? And so we want to make sure that we're tailoring our resumes to fit what we're using it to apply for. So I would say, you know, consider what graduate program you're looking at, go to their website, look at their uh, admission criteria, what they're looking for, look at past admissions, you know, past alumni, graduates, those types of things. Um, and try to align what you're offering uh, in terms of value as much as you can to what you find out. Um, but it's the same as any company. Do your research, dive in, and try to mirror what they're looking for as much as possible. So one of your last slides uh, talked about resumes and CVs. Mm -hmm. um, so which resume format is best to use? Chronological, functional, mixed, or even a CV? So it depends on where, where, what you're applying for. Um, most of the time, chronological is the way that we would encourage you to go. However, if you have, um, let's say you're 20 years into, into your career, right? And you have, you know, eight different companies that you worked at, right? Chronological may, may get kind of overwhelming. And so instead of just kind of pulling them all in, in that chronological format, another way that we could do it is leadership experience, um, accounting experience, you know, um, we could look at marketing experience, you know, and kind of break them into um, subsections and talk about accomplishment statements within those subsections. And then at the very end, just say, here's the company I worked at, here's my title, here's the years. And that way we just kind of collect those in one place and then collect our accomplishment statements somewhere else. But I wouldn't recommend that unless you have like, like I said, like eight to 10 different companies you've made stops at because that's, you know, probably a better way to organize it. But if you've only worked at three or four places, I would list them chronologically. Um, and then the CV really only comes into play if we're talking about, you know, working in academia, we're working in research, we're working in, um, the sciences or in healthcare, there's, those are, the CVs are really kind of tailored towards specific industries. And the difference between a resume and a CV, I think this gets confused a lot, but the main difference between a resume and a CV is research experience, publications, presentations that are listed um, in totality. So I said, you know, if you have a one page resume or a two page resume, value is what we're really looking for. A CV could be 15 pages, right? If you go to UAB's um, UAB scholars and look at the professors that teach on campus at UAB, some of them have CVs that are like 10, 15 pages, but that's because they publish books. They've been to conferences where they presented, um, they've done research, those types of things. And so, you know, the more we do those things, we want to add into that CV. Uh, but that's really only, like I said, for education, uh, research, healthcare, those types of things. What about you? including a picture of yourself uh, or even a LinkedIn profile on your resume? You could do that. It's, it's really up to you. Um, you know, it's kind of a tricky thing because, you know, you want to be evaluated on your experiences, right? You don't want to be evaluated on your appearance. Um, and so I would encourage you to really consider that and think about if it's something that you want to um, open the door to. You know, I think it's, it's kind of just a unfortunate reality that we live in a world where, you know, people make judgments of others very quickly. However, that is something that is a reality. Um, but playing devil's advocate to that, you know, if they make a judgment on you based on a picture, I would say you probably don't want to work for that company anyway. So um, that's really kind of a personal choice, uh, you know, if you want to put yourself out there. Again, remember, as I said at the beginning, if you're using your resume effectively, it's going to be in the hands of many, many different people. And you never know who's going to be looking at it. So your face may be floating around in a bunch of different circles. I think I lost you, Greg. Are you still there? Nope. I just stayed muted. No, 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 no. <laughs> I apologize. I, I'm having thunder in my area. So I, I'm trying no, to limit my uh, background noise with you. Um, should you in include salary range or salary requirements mm. on the resume? Quick answer. No, don't do that. Um, that's really more for an interview. And I will say this, and this is a whole different conversation. When it comes to salary negotiation, you don't want to be the first one to say a number. You want them to be the first one to say a number. Uh, because you never know what they're thinking. You may undershoot yourself a little bit, um, but let them make that first move. But you certainly don't want to do that on a resume. Um, 
you know, a, a lot of positions now are posting salary ranges, which is good. Um, so you kind of have an idea, but um, you don't want to make the first move when it comes to salary, especially on your resume. What if you're transitioning from one field to another, a CV to resume, healthcare to say tech? Yeah. What ways would you go about that? And is that something that you have an answer for? Yeah, absolutely. So the biggest piece there is look at where you're moving. So we know where we came from, but what's more important is where are we moving to, right? And so we need to take the experiences that we had where we were coming from and translate those into where we're going to. So, and to be honest with you, that's not that uncommon. There are so many people changing careers that it, it is it is very, very common. Um, and I don't want you to feel like that makes you an outlier, that makes you a failure. It, it, there's no judgment whatsoever. I think people... Um, Careers are evolving a lot more now than they ever have before. And people are finding ways to make impacts in very different and diverse ways across the span of their career. And so what really becomes important um, is finding what centers you, right? Is it is it skill sets? Is it expertise? Is it experiences? Because whether it's healthcare or tech or whatever it may be, there are qualities, there are characteristics, there are skills that every employer is going to value, right? And so what we're really trying to do when we make those types of transitions is look at what do we do in the past? that we can communicate effectively as a value moving forward, right? So whether it's leadership, problem solving, creativity, uh, you know, you're strategic, you can think outside the box, you have a lot of, you know, network connections or whatever it may be. Um, let's find those things that are, are kind of unique to you that add value to you as an applicant and make sure we accentuate those as you make that transition. Maybe this isn't a question that you can um, answer, but what's the worst resume mistake you've ever seen Mm. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot having worked in the career center and you don't have to be you know, specific to who it was, sure. your company and stuff like that, but there has to be one thing that really sticks out. I think I've seen a lot of bad resumes, so it's a really challenging question. Um, one of the weird, so this is kind of a weird one. I'll say this. One of the weirdest ones I've had um, was someone had the job description of the position they were applying for on the resume they were using to apply for that position. Like then they didn't have their experiences. It was just the job description saying like, this is the job description I want. Please say yes, you know? Um, so that was kind of weird. But I, you know, I think a lot of people are well-intended uh, with their resumes, but I think going back to what I said earlier, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make so often, and it, it pains me because I see people who would be great fits for these positions make this mistake. And that is using the same resume for every single position that they apply for. And I know that seems, like like kind of trivial, I know I'm harping on that, but I've seen so many students who apply for various different positions during my time at the, at the Career Center, but they're using that same exact resume for literally 50 to 100 different positions. Um, and it, it makes me sad because I know that if we had time to work together, they had time to tailor it, they would have gotten so many different calls, you know, from those employers that they were applying to. Um, and so I think, you know, most people are well-intended with their resumes. Everybody wants a good job, right? And so everybody puts effort and time into it. Uh, but I think it's really important to make sure that we tailor it to what we're applying for. And we're not just blasting out the same resume to 50 or 100 different employers and expecting a positive result because you're not going to get one. That's just not how it works. So one can be attached to what they've done and they want to have those accomplishments on the resume. So how do you determine which experiences should be included and which of the bullet points should be a part of the resume? Because Somebody like me, you know, I might have eight, 10 things. And it's like, wait a minute, you got to narrow that down to that one role. Obviously, part of it is having it towards specific jobs and you're tailoring it that way. But how can you kind of determine which experiences are more important? That's a great question. I think one of the biggest challenges um, in doing that is really to divorce your ego, you know, because, you um, you know, like I said, we've put spent time in all of those places we've worked. We we worked really, really hard to earn those accomplishment statements that we're highlighting. Um, but it really is most important that we put ourselves in the positions of the companies that we're applying for. Will they see value? Is it something that aligns with what they're working for? Is it something they're prioritizing with this position? Um, and if it's not, it's hard and painful as it needs to be. Uh, we probably need to think about cutting that, right? Because again, the more that's on the resume, the more you're diluting what is on the resume, right? You know, if you think about, um, you know, a drop of hot sauce in, you know, a cup of soup, that could be pretty spicy. But if you drop some hot sauce into a, a pot that you're baking of soup, it's not that spicy, right? And so we now kind of keep that mentality in mind that 
if we're wanting to make the impact, we want that hot sauce to really kick. We need to make sure we're putting it into a smaller bucket because the bigger that bucket gets, the more diluted it's going to be and the less impact it's going to have. So really the, the, the trick of a resume is how do you put, how do you say the most while also saying the least, right? I know that sounds kind of contradictory, but you know, how can we tailor it and, and whittle it down and concentrate it as much as we possibly can so that that resume gets the most impact that we possibly could have um, as those people are reviewing it. Adam, thank you so much for spending the better part of an hour, your lunchtime with us for this Lunch and Learn part of the Backpacks, the Briefcases series. It's always great to have you on and we're looking forward to uh, next week when we have you back again. Yeah, looking forward to it. I can't wait. All right, thanks again. And for everybody who did attend today, just a heads up, a recording will be made available on our website tomorrow. It might be even this afternoon. We'll see how the work schedule goes for me. Um, you can register for other upcoming Backpacks to Briefcases events and earn credit toward an Evergreen certificate. Adam will be back with us Thursday, April 14th for another Lunch and Learn interview skills, as we talked about. Join us as we explore the important skills needed to effectively communicate who you are and what you can contribute to a company if hired. Then on Thursday, April 21st, we will welcome Gina Kennedy, AVP of Training and Community Involvement for Legacy Credit Union for another Lunch and Learn, Budgeting 201. During the session, we'll discuss methods of saving money while also managing and ditching debt. On Thursday, April 28th, we'll jump into leveraging LinkedIn, build a personal brand and network. This webinar will feature Brandon Wright, director of the UAB Career Center, and will help identify components of an effective elevator pitch and how to develop your own. And finally, be part of our final Backpacks to Briefcases event of the spring with Lunch and Learn, I'm Home on Wednesday, May 4th. We'll be joined by Leah Ragland of Legacy Credit Union as we find out how to approach, approach first-time home ownership. You can find all these events at alumni.uab.edu slash events. Looking for ways to volunteer? Join us this Saturday for a day of giving back to the Birmingham community. And yes, it counts towards an evergreen certificate. We'll be at Glen Iris Elementary from 8 to 12 to help spruce things up and work on some much needed projects at the school. You can register at alumni.uab.edu slash Unite Day. Just a heads up, breakfast and lunch are provided. And if you're planning to hit the spring game later that day, go Blazers. We'll be done in time for you to get there. Looking for a podcast to get you through your day or commute? Take a listen to UAB Green and Told. New episodes drop every other week and feature members of the UAB community. Meet one of the first persons to put on a Blaze mascot uniform, meet an Army general, and discover why alumni chose their career paths that they took. Download a podcast on Spotify and the Apple Podcast app or visit our website. And be sure to stay on top of all things alumni on social media. You can look us up by searching UAB Alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On LinkedIn, search Alumni Career Community. And we'd love to know what you thought of today's webinar. I think this Scantron's not working, so we'll make sure we can do that in the future. We can go ahead and try scanning it. Um, I apologize for that, but that one does not look right. Go ahead and drop it in the chat. I'll stay on here for, for a little bit. We'll make sure we get the Scantron right for the next webinar. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar with Adam Roderick. Have a great day. And as always, go Blazers.